how many times have you been sitting in a meeting and about halfway through, you have your internal question going like, what the F am I doing here? Welcome to Dialogue Creates, more than talk, where we explore issues and solutions together through the lens of dialogue. Thank you for joining your hosts, Hitta Vanderpool and Leon Jaworski. Hello, everyone, and welcome back to the More Than Talk podcast from Dialogue Creates. My name is Leon Jaworski. I'm joined here with Hitta Vanderpool my mentor and colleague in dialogue, along with Susan Taylor. And I am so happy to be back with you today, Hitta. And uh, thank you so much for joining me. Well, it's always a pleasure, uh, Leon. And I just realized it's uh, it's our first podcast recording of 2024. So that's uh, we've, we've got ourselves uh, a good start. Thank you for that reminder. Yes, I'm very excited about the start of this new year. And certainly to bringing dialogue to our audience in further capacities. So I'm very excited for this today. Yeah, me too. And uh, obviously a a warm welcome to all our listeners and viewers uh, from all different platforms and and channels. And uh, happy to kick this off with, uh, with all of you in our 2024 beginnings. Yes. And on that note, if you are watching us on YouTube, please give us a like and subscribe. We are now on all major audio platforms for streaming as well. So if you happen to be listening to us there, please join us on those platforms and enjoy. So thank you all very much. Today's topic is, I think, a fun one and very pertinent. And We want to have dialogue together around how we can bring dialogue perhaps into our business lives. Uh, Hitta, I know you have some wonderful ideas around this. And how would you describe today's topic? Yeah, I would say it's um, because we usually get a lot of uh, questions about, you know, uh, the fact that we are saying that dialogue is more uh, more of a way of being rather than the conversation itself, and it sounds actually pretty weird. So if you know, a lot of questions come around that and saying, "What do you mean, actually?" and uh, and what's the benefit of all of this? So I think um, we can dive into some real life examples out of business, but also individually on uh, how do we apply dialogue uh, with a capital D the way we uh, um, we see this, according to uh, Dr. David Bohm. And, um, and what do I get out of it, you know, whether for myself, for my team, for my organization. So I think um, we can um, share today with, uh, with the audience some very practical examples uh, while we're diving deep into some of the aspects of, uh, of dialogue. I agree. And this is something that actually came up for us in one of our dialogue course sessions. We have been administering this one year mastering Bohmian dialogue course, and we had some wonderful moments with some of our, uh, co-creators in that space. And this is one of the things that comes up often is how, how are we applying this now in business, in our daily lives? And I think today's uh, topic around, you know, simplifying this, this may be difficult to pinpoint idea will help our audience to understand how we really do apply this in business. So I'm very excited to dive into this topic with you. And uh, without further ado, let's get into it, shall we? Let's do so, uh, Leon. Um, Yeah, just just um, building on what you what you said, we're in the final two uh, sessions of that uh, Mastering Bohemian Dialogue uh, 12 month course online. And 
the, the final part of this uh, total annual course uh, is focused around how to facilitate dialogue. And that's where these type of questions are, are surfacing, where we, um, yeah, we really want to know how we can live this in a way um, to invite others to join us in that particular way of having a conversation and in, in our uh, wordings, that particular way of being. Yes, yes, absolutely. I, I think the interplay between participation and facilitation has been a really important element in these recent sessions. And one of the things that we have explored with our group is how we can be both a participant and a facilitator. And I think that's a uh, perhaps a really good jump off point for us here, because often when we're discussing future planning or conceptual ideas, it's sometimes in this environment where we view one person as facilitating a meeting or maybe just everyone else as participants. But I'd love to hear how you describe that relationship between facilitator and participant and how we can move in and out of those roles to have effective dialogue. Yeah, I really like that um, starting point, uh, Leon, because what I often actually suggest to uh, teams uh, when they're having their uh, meetings, their corporate environment meetings, is to actually uh, divide amongst themselves separate roles because it's very difficult to have multiple roles being fulfilled by one person at the same time. And I think there's a lot of elements of dialogue with a capital D being involved in just that. Because if we are preceding the, the, the meeting and we have that role, um, then usually we interpret that one of setting the goals you know, the agenda points, mentioning it, opening up an agenda point, closing it. And we're so focused on that. Um, what you often see is that combined with that, that timekeeping is also in that role. And already those two combined make it very difficult. But um, focusing on just that prevents the person in that role to actually listen very carefully to the content of the conversation to what's being said, what's not being said, to sensing into the energy in the room, uh, how people perceive certain things that are being said, how they respond, if they respond at all. So it, there's a lot of these aspects that we are not capable of focusing on while we have a defined role in practicality. And so I think it's interesting to start right here because... All of that is taking place at the same time. And there's so many things that we can focus on and sense into. But given the fact that we are only um, focusing on the, on the role and the uh, attributes of that role, we usually forget about the whole picture of what's going on. And, it's, and it's, uh, it, it requires practice. Yes, it certainly does. I, I think the... Interesting thing that came up for me as I was listening to uh, how you were describing how we come into things in a certain role. For example, if we come into something this way as feeling like we're only going to be a participant, that might hinder our thought process in terms of, of contributing and having that co-creative energy where we truly feel like we're on an even playing field in order to really sense in, like you said, to that energy. And this might feel perhaps a little uncomfortable for some. Well, we're, we're in business. I'm at work. Why, why are we talking about sensing and feelings? But realistically, when we truly let go of perhaps these defense mechanisms or preconceived notions of how we need to be. And through setting the field and through understanding that we can shift 
our perspective and work our way into and out of different roles, I think we then open up a lot more opportunity to not only, as you said, listen to each other to fully understand, and also to be a co-facilitator in order to truly help to co-create and affect change. Yeah, so building on that, uh, Leon, thanks for sharing, is um, I think it's it's one of the obstacles. Uh, could be, it's not always the case, but could be the roles that we define and that we divide amongst ourselves. Um, so as just said, uh, what I usually see is that uh, sometimes it's, there's a complete lack of roles, which brings in chaos because nobody is taking charge of, of the whole meeting and, and the dynamics of the meeting. That's one, uh, one side of it. All the others, uh, you know, all the way on the other side is that we give all the roles to one person. So one person who's in charge of the meeting has to do timekeeping, has to do check whether there's a space for closing commitments, uh, for summarizing commitments, making sure that everybody has his or her saying uh, is just too much. So th there's one end of the spectrum and the other end of the spectrum and all that is in between. Um, so roles in itself could be um, a limiting factor in getting to dialogue with a capital D. That's one. You just mentioned listen to fully understand. Um, in my practice, uh, what I usually see is, um, well, in general, I could describe it as how we show up in the meeting is crucial for its output. So in corporate environments, usually the setting is back-to-back -back meetings, right? Whether it's online or physical meetings in the office, it's back-to-back. -back. So we're being uh, challenged in actually starting on time. So we're constantly chasing time. And there's a huge pitfall in that, is that once everybody is in the room, or maybe not even everybody, we just start to dive into the content right away. So let's get through this agenda and everybody is coming from a place where they want their topic to be handled and to be, you know, coming through that meeting. So it's a very egoistic, if you like, approach. I want this. I need this answer out of this meeting. I'm not going to check with anybody else. I'm just going to make sure I get what I want, right? And so it puts you as a person into a different modus, a different way of being. You're not there to co-create. You're not there to really listen, to fully understand. You're not there to explore different perspectives. You're just there to get what you want out of that meeting so you can proceed. Imagine the amounts of, say, coincidental co-creations, idea generations that we miss out on because we're constantly coming from that angle. Um, so I think that's the second uh, op potential obstacle is are we, are we conscious on how we arrive? Is it a more a collective of monologues? Is it more a debate? You know, in a debate, we want to be right. We want to win the discussion. Discussion is another one. In discussion, it's more about convincing. But in dialogue, it's more about sharing, exploring, and being in service of. And so I think already there is a complete difference in how we show up from where we are actually contributing and entering our conversations. Wonderful ways to un unfold these concepts, Hida. And as I was listening to you, hearing you describe how we often go into these meetings just trying to accomplish getting what we want, that's often checking an item off of our list to say, okay, I've done this so that now my job is done and I can move on to my next meeting knowing that I've checked this item off. But that's very limiting. 
And I think one of the important things that we want to share with our audience always, and certainly today, is what do we really get out of this practice of dialogue? Maybe from even a uh, an inward perspective, what do I get out of this by practicing it? And on the in the bigger picture, what does everyone else get as a result of that? And therein is that co-creative energy, that willingness to co-facilitate and participate. And rather than coming into a meeting space with the simple agenda of I'm going to accomplish what's on my task list and I'm going to be right in this debate and I'm going to tell people my brilliant idea and if I'm facilitating my idea has to be the best, even if I might be willing to listen to other ideas, I have a preconceived notion of how this meeting is going to go. Sometimes we fall into those pitfalls. And part of our practice of dialogue is to try to break through those barriers and try to really open the doors for this more co-creative energy and this and this flow of openness. So when we talk about what do we get out of dialogue, how would you describe what someone could gain as an individual? And then what could we gain as a whole through this practice of dialogue when we apply it? Yeah, uh, great question. To start off with, I think, and, and David Bohm mentioned uh, that a lot, um, is the comparison between fragmentation and wholeness. And I think it uh, applies to an individual as a way of being. So am I with myself functioning as a whole or am I with myself also fragmented? which means it, 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 in, in my definition, it has to do with consciousness. How conscious am I of all my patterns, my uh, inner processes while the meeting is going on? How alert am I and how connected am I with my true essence and with what's going on inside me while the meeting is going? So that's one aspect. If I'm not conscious of that, then I'm only representing myself as a fragment of myself. So if I'm not a capable and willing, the words that you just used, to express when I feel something, when I have an emotion, when somebody else is saying something, then I'm not showing the whole of myself. I'm just showing a fragment, right? And so dialogue with a capital D, the way David, Dr. David Bohm uh, envisioned it to be, is all towards that wholeness. It's about creating this field where we connect truly and wholly with ourselves, with what's going on inside of us and what we are expressing. That's on the individual part. But we also see fragmentation when we zoom out in the meeting itself. How far are we aligned with everybody that is participating in the meeting? Maybe even on the desired outcome of the meeting. You know, are we aligned? Usually when I get into uh, team facilitations and we start the meeting, then uh, I ask people, I say, how many times have you been sitting in a meeting? And about halfway through, you have your internal question going like, what the F am I doing here? You know, it's, this is not my meeting. Why am I here? And I, I kid you not, I think nine out of 10 people raise their hands and say, oh, yes, I have that a lot. And so what I see in our corporate environments more and more is that they're being driven by their agenda. So they come to work, they open up their agenda to see what their uh, program is for the day. They're not checking. They're not going like, okay, what is this meeting all about? You know, do I need to be there? Do I want to be there? What's my contribution? Very rarely, all of these questions are being asked way before, unless we initiated the meeting and we want something out of it. 
so that we can continue as an initiator. So the alignment, and again, fragments of all individuals being in that meeting can become a whole if we share and participate from out a certain way of being. And that's where dialogue with a capital D can make a difference. So if we are operating from out of a monologue, from out of debate or discussion, we're not getting to that level of wholeness where we are connected with all that are participating and we open up the possibility of um, creating new realities, of realities because of expressing and sharing different perspectives, realities that might emerge, that people go like, oh, I didn't know that. Oh, interesting, you see it from that side. I, I didn't think about that at all. And so we are helping each other to get a view of the whole, the whole of different perspectives. If we are just interested in our own perspective, we just see a fragment. So again, there's fragmentation and wholeness. If we zoom out again and we look at organizational level, then you can, with different departments, you have this similar things. You know, if I am marketing department, uh, then the only thing I care about is how the message is coming across to our potential buyers and customers, right? How often do we see there's tensions between sales and marketing departments because they have different objectives? And when these meetings take place, you can sense that tension. Is it being mentioned? Is there a really co-creation? Not always, because we only see it from our own perspective. And so imagine this, that when we arrive in these meetings, more from uh, a way of being of dialogue with a capital D, it opens up this potential pathway to wholeness, to being truly connected. Doesn't mean that you have to agree on everything. It doesn't mean that you're not there to get a certain outcome. But the way you participate in that meeting is different, where you leave opportunities to come to co creation and to come to a complete new reality creation that you didn't think of before because you didn't have that whole picture right so and even if we zoom out even more and look at our current condition of uh, of our global status you see national conflicts wars this applies there same way is it difficult because of historical uh, sensitivities uh, historical pains uh, emotions, all of that is there. So it's not easy. Uh, the other day I was invited to be uh, joining a meeting where a Palestinian and an Israeli uh, would join as well. It, ha it was canceled because it was too, uh, too emotional. It was so uh, loaded with all that pain of decades and generations. It wasn't the right timing for them. And so even though I believe that dialogue with a capital D can open up these pathways of co-creation again, I can also see that sometimes the tensions are so high that it, it also comes down to, to finding the right moment to do so, uh, to be able to participate from that way I just described. And I'll, I'll hold here for a moment and give you some time to, uh, to respond as well. Uh, but this was coming up for me. That's very powerful. And on the element of timing, that's a, a really poignant item to really consider. How often have we needed or wanted to bring up something, perhaps even in our personal lives, that have emotionally driven concepts behind them or something that we really need to unload for lack of better terminology or even in those moments where you're ready to transition to a new job and you have to talk to your uh, superior about saying hey I'm giving my notice that's a nerve-wracking experience and those feelings may 
lead to all sorts of different avenues that could unfold. Is the timing right? Well, sometimes our hand is forced on timing. But even with that, we talked about just a moment ago zooming out. If we zoom in, maybe within the the context of a single day, when is a good time in that day to sense in to finding that timing to accomplish what we want? We can zoom back out again. When is the right time as it feels right? Uh, Your very powerful example of an Israeli representative, a Palestinian representative, and the emotions behind that, absolutely, that can be the best decision in that in that particular instance to pause and wait for the right time. Uh, earlier in this episode, you had mentioned the word chaos, and I wanted to come back to that because often we listen to the word chaos and we apply it in a way that just, if I say chaos and I close my eyes and imagine chaos, I, I see too much happening. I see and feel overwhelmed. However, we've played with this in our dialogue sessions and through a quote that we shared that David Bohm wrote or, or said, you know, chaos can actually be something that we can embrace. And I think that's something that would be interesting for us to dive into a bit here, because often in these business meetings, it can feel chaotic through that fragmentation that you mentioned. Inherently, being fragmented in any capacity is not being cohesive. So in these fragmented mindsets or scenarios where suddenly emotions build and chaos might ensue, how could we view chaos from a different perspective? Yeah, it's a good one. And it came to my mind as well. So uh, great mind think like uh, Leon. <laughs> um, <laughs> Um, yeah, so just to build on that, it's, we have a, a negative connotation towards chaos, towards tensions, um, and we, we tend to avoid that. So once we, we sense that it might go that direction, we move away from it without expressing it. And I think that's where dialogue makes a huge difference with a capital D, is not to avoid this. It is not something to avoid. It's actually a very uh, fruitful soil, if you like, for creating new realities, for coming up with something out of that, you know, that symbolic flower of a lotus flower that can only grow and, and have this beautiful flower if the roots are in the mud. And so I think that symbolizes a lot about how we deal with dialogue. We have the courage and the vulnerability to step into that mud, the chaos, the potential emotions that might arise. Why? Because we want to dig deeper in, in, in where these emotions and tensions actually come from. What's the source of them? Because behind emotions and tensions lies a lot of information. Why are you being triggered right now in this meeting? It's valuable information, yet most of us run away from it because we don't want anyone in that meeting to be triggered. Let's all pamper it and and let's not go there, you know, Mm -hmm. and we want to avoid. And yet we're, what we are avoiding is getting more information because if you would ask you, you would see me being triggered in a meeting that you and I would have. And you would have the courage and the vulnerability to ask me and say, hey, what's going on? Because I noticed something is is changing. And I would have the courage and the vulnerability, step into the vulnerability of actually um, connecting with myself, being able to view my inner processes and say, well, I have a feeling that one of my core values is being stepped upon when I hear you say this and this. 
You know, I have a feeling I'm being limited in my freedom and freedom for me is a huge value. That's why I see myself getting triggered. And, and that's what you notice in me. And then you say, oh, but it's not my intention to limit your freedom at all. So what makes you say that? Open question. Because you want to fully understand. So both of us, from out of courage and vulnerability, are diving deep into what's actually going on here. What's the essence? What's the valuable covered information that we need, both you and I, to get to something that is beneficial to both of us? So that's just to describe you a process that we usually avoid. But by doing so, we are avoiding essential information to actually move ahead and to get to something that is essential to do together. So it's interesting how dialogue can can really benefit in in this process. Yes, those are such great examples and and as I as I think about it for myself you the one thing that really struck me as something that I've experienced is going into a meeting or a situation and being so cautious, so trepidatious of not hurting anyone's feelings, of not having, as you mentioned, the courage to, in my own words, call something out. And this might be the one example that you gave of saying, hey, Hedda, why do you seem to be triggered by this? It could also be on an internal level by calling out, hey, I feel like I'm being triggered by this. We are then accomplishing the goal of, as David Bohm has said, and as we've said many times on on this podcast, suspending for all to witness how we're feeling, what we're thinking, rather than internalizing it, rather than pushing it back down for fear of disruption or hurting someone's feelings or anything like that. If we actually have that level of courage. Yeah. To, yeah, to call or, out ourselves. Yeah, or to, or to avoid judgments. We are fearful of ju- being judged by others. Yes. So what you usually see is if I, if I express emotions, I will be seen as weak. If mm. I'm weak, I will not get my promotion because they think I cannot handle, right? So a lot of this, zooming out again, in the culture of a company is crucial. Because if there is proof that people who express emotions are not being promoted, nobody will. So there's a, there's a lot of these elements that can play a role. And, and if we start off with at least noticing what's going on inside of ourselves on an individual base, then find the courage and the vulnerability to just express and others will follow because especially when leaders are operating from out of dialogue with a capital D, it's, it's very attractive for other people to follow and to step into that field that is being created where we can be courageous and vulnerable at the same time. And yeah, I think that's very beneficial to, to collectives, whether it's a team or, or an organization or, or a country. I agree. And, and you mentioned leadership. I mean, that's, that's the, cornerstone of what we really want to accomplish is developing these leadership skills within everyone. And you had mentioned the the current business culture, which of course shifts from company to company, from region of the world to another. But when it comes down to this perception of I've got to act a certain way that is not myself in order to fit the culture, then we're not taking that courageous step to help affect change, right? This is, this is one of the biggest elements of dialogue is an ability to affect change. Again, through co-creation and through perhaps examples of good leadership, even if you may not be in a traditional leadership role, 
that comes back around to that interplay between participation and facilitation. If we step into that role of facilitation, maybe even though we're not traditionally the facilitator of a meeting, we're exercising that good leadership quality. It is so difficult, and yet it is so simple at the same time. And just as with any practice, the more that we practice, the easier it becomes. Yeah, great. I think to summarize, we talked about um, fragmentation and wholeness for individuals and for collectives. Um, that related to what you just mentioned, uh, Leon, I think um, it's a, a very powerful message to everybody out there to say how we show up individually has an impact on the outcome. Even though we are not fully conscious of it all the time, how we show up has an impact, a profound impact on the outcome of any interaction, whether it's a meeting or just a personal uh, get together. Uh, again, how we show up has a huge, profound impact on the outcome. And uh, there's a, a lot more essentials of dialogue with a capital D as a way of being, the way uh, David Bohm um, uh, envisioned it to be, that we can talk about in uh, all of our courses that we give, whether it's the Mastering Bohmium Dialogue uh, course, which is uh, lasting a year online. We also have shorter ones of three months, and we also have uh, individual reach outs or, or coaching sessions where there can be uh, provided an introduction or a better understanding based on, on questions of our audience. So to, to dive deeper into basically the topic of this podcast is what's the, the, the benefit and how do I apply it? So I want to uh, lead people to our website to um, check out the offerings of 2024. And feel free to reach out to either one of us or to Susan Taylor as well. Uh, we're happy to explain, to go on a journey together and to experience dialogue with a capital D. Yes, thank you, Hedda. And for our audience, as Hedda mentioned, please feel free to reach out to us. We have links on all of our different ways that you can reach us in the description of every platform that you might be viewing or listening to us on. And we would love to connect with you and we would love to help in your endeavors to affect change in your workplace. So once again, we appreciate all of you. Please make sure to engage with us. If you're on YouTube, like, subscribe, and share our episodes if you find value in what we're doing. And perhaps you think someone on your leadership team might benefit from hearing what we have to share or reaching out to us to help to affect some change within your organization, reach out to us. This is what we do. This is why we're here. So we appreciate all of you. Personally, Hitta, I appreciate you very much. And this has been a really fulfilling episode to have with you. So thank you, as always, for your guidance, your mentorship, and your contributions. Well, thanks to you, uh, Leon. We uh, were capable of, uh, of doing this together and uh, looking forward to many, many more. So uh, thank you uh, as well. Absolutely. Well, until next time, everybody, take care and happy dialogue. Thank you for participating with us. Please visit our LinkedIn page to share your thoughts, questions, and suggestions for future episodes. Remember to like us, share, and subscribe. Until next time, this has been More Than Talk.